Good morning, church. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Scott, and I'm really glad that you're here today on this beautiful spring day. I have a couple quick announcements to lift up. Um, the first one, today, if you are able, I am going to give you a personal invitation to stick around after church. <clears throat> we are going to um, have a brunch together. Um, tea and scones is what we've been calling it, but you know they weren't going to leave it at scones, and so they're doing various casseroles and fruit and 12 kinds of juices and whatever. Um, so I hope that you stick around, just enjoy each other's company. And then um, for those that are interested, um, I will be doing, well, I'll be doing whether you're interested or not, but um, we'll be doing a talk on the history of Methodism. Since we're talking about tea and we're talking about scones, we thought it would be fun to talk about our British roots and um, how we came to be Methodists. Uh, so we'll spend a lot of time with John Wesley after church today, if you're interested. And part of what we're doing um, is we are collecting um, items for mission wing shut-ins. Um, so on the side there, you'll see a display with some of the, the personal care products. But one of the other things we're also collecting is tea. Um, they specifically ask for boxes of tea bags so that's one of the things we're collecting. If you brought it today, that's great. Uh, it was just part of that celebration of uh, tea and scones. Um, but uh, we'll have a space for that as well. And the last thing I'd like to lift up um, is um, just a couple of weeks here, we will have another open house at the Parsonage. That'll be um, the last Friday of the month, which if somebody's got their calendar, they can tell me the date because I don't have it in front of me. Luke 26? Maybe. Okay. Sure. All right. So maybe the 26th is the last Friday of the month. I think it's the 26th. We're 80% confident there. Um, but it'll be at 5 o'clock. It's a potluck. We'll bring something to, to pass, and then we'll just stick around and play some games together and just have some fun and enjoy each other's company. So those are the announcements I have, my friends. So this is the day the Lord has made, and so let's together rejoice. I'm going to have you stand and join me in singing Take Time to Be Holy, found in the hymnal at 395 or on the screen.
God of hope, we see your love poured out for us in all the world. Make us more like you. Teach us to live together as one community, human and beyond human, creature and created to your glory. So your love is known among all the living. Amen. And now it's time for the children's message. If the kids would come forward. And right after the children's message, I will be picking up the prayer cards. So please have those ready and I will collect them. all this morning. Good morning. I have a question for you. Ready? What does God love? Yeah, he does. That was an easy one. But what else does he love? That's the planet. Yeah. Does God love <coughs> Well, okay. Does, does, does God love shoes? I think. I don't know. I don't think I think God loves that shoes make us happy and keep our feet safe, but I don't know that he loves shoes. Maybe. We'll find out. What else? Can you think of anything else that God loves? Helping. Yeah. God loves us when we do things like help or when we pray. What else? Share. Excellent. Yes. Right? What else? People before yourself, right? Exactly. What else do you think God loves? Kind, excellent, excellent, right? So some things we can see, right? We can see um, people, right? And we can say, "I love you," or we can see the earth and we can take care of the earth because God loves that. But God also loves other things that's hard to see, like kindness and helping and sharing. You got one? Okay, you can tell me afterwards. We can remember. It's okay. Um, God loves all those things that we do, too. And so because God loves them, we're supposed to do them, too. Right? The things that God loves, we're supposed to love. What do you think? He likes us to be safe. Yeah, he likes us to be safe, too. That's a good one, too. Real good. He does like us to live in houses. Yeah, he wants us to be safe. You're right. All right. So why don't we pray? And then you can go back and, and do your crafts or whatever you've got next to um, dear God, thank you so much for loving us. We're grateful that you love us. And thank you for loving our planet and the trees and the sky and the moon and the stars. Thank you also for loving peace and hope and charity and kindness and all the other things. And help us because you love them, Lord. Help us to, to bring those into the world too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. And I'm going to ask, if I've got to stand, y'all got to stand. We're going to sing, Lord, I want to be a Christian, number 402. Please stand.
scripture this morning comes from 1st John chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him beloved we are God's children now what we will be he has not yet been revealed what we do know is this when he is revealed we will be like him for we will see him as he is and all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness sin is lawlessness you know that he was revealed to take away sins and in him there is no sin no one who abides in him sins no one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Thanks be to God for his reading. Can you pray with me, please? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be granted acceptable in your sight because you are tip my hand a little bit with the children's message, but can we love things as well as people? When I was in high school, I was obsessed with cars. I grew up in the last of the 80s time frame, that tail end of time when many people were still working and tinkering on their cars in shop class and in their garages. My high school parking lot was filled with souped up muscle cars that had been lovingly worked on by my peers for months and months diligently saving their pennies to get just the right carburetor, the right exhaust, or the right rim for their car. But back then, just like today, I did not enjoy working on cars. It never appealed to me to have oil on my clothes or grease under my nails. So as a young man, I found myself instead obsessed with European sports cars. I wasn't satisfied with a tricked out Chevy Nova, I wanted exotic, expensive cars with engines that could power aircraft, interiors draped with hand-stitched Italian leather, and cars that were precise, overly engineered works of art from German um, engineers. At 16, I knew I would have made it in life. I thought I could only call myself successful in life when my keys said Ferrari. And if you had asked me back then, I would have told you without hesitation that I love cars. I thought about them, I read about them, I had posters on the walls and statistics memorized. But did I really love them? Can you love things like a car as well as people? It's kind of a philosophical question, isn't it? Can you love something that doesn't have the capacity to love you back? Well, I do think you can, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a healthy love or a love of any substance. There's no spirituality to that love of cars. Obsession is probably a better word for it, but we like to substitute the word love because it's more palatable. It's easier to say, I love my green Packers. I love my morning coffee. I love Disney. You've probably said something similar in your life over an object. I love lamp. But it's easier to say I love Disney than it is to say I'm obsessed over Disney, isn't it? So is it love? Did I love cars as a 16-year-old boy? Can a middle-aged man love Disney? I suppose. It's not a deep love. It's not a lasting love or a spiritual love. You can debate tonight at dinner with your family if you think you can truly love an object and to what capacity. But I believe our collective or individual love of things is, is fleeting and at best superficial. What about a bit, something a bit more abstract, like an idea or a movement? Can you love something like justice? Can you love justice for the oppressed or downtrodden? Can you love opportunity for the marginalized and forgotten? And similarly, can you love righteousness? Can you love peace or hope or dignity? Peace isn't an object, right? It's not a tangible thing like a car or a sports team. 
peace is a state of being or feeling. So can we love peace? And again, I think so. And I think we truly love something like justice with a deep spiritual love. Loving justice is a holy action. Justice is something that God loves, something that God wants. If you remember Amos 6.24, it says, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a loving stream. Justice is something God wants to see us work towards on the earth. No matter where we fall in the orthodoxy spectrum, I think we can all agree that God wants righteousness and peace to prevail on the earth. So I think that makes a good litmus test. If we believe an idea or thing is important to God, then it's something we too are called to love, cared for, cultivate, and protect. So next question. Does God love purity? First John 3 talks about those who have hope, the hope that comes from being God's children, that hope that will be revealed when God comes. Those that have this hope will purify themselves. So my friends, I ask you, what does it mean for us to purify ourselves, and does God love purity? Growing up, I attended a lot of different churches with a wide variety of different beliefs and perspectives. Most of the churches, I don't ever recall being overly concerned with the concept of purity or teaching purity. I mean, they did, but it wasn't an obsession, except one. The one church in question was, shall we say, a very, very, very fundamental church. This particular church, on more than one occasion, held books or burning services in the back parking lot if they helped frames their, their understanding and how they, they taught. I would characterize the church as very conservative, and their doctrine tended to be hyper-fixated on specific points, like purity. And that was important to teach teenagers. And I don't know how many times I have heard adults mention, preach, extol, and exhort the need for purity in my life, but only in terms of sexuality, saving myself for marriage, as we say. Purity became a synonym for chastity. Keep yourselves pure until marriage, I must have heard 10,000 times. But I think that church from my youth missed a bigger definition of purity. There's a bit of irony there in the book Burning Church, thinking about purity only in terms of sexuality. They certainly were concerned about keeping the world and any worldly thoughts at bay as the pastor decided what the worldly thoughts were. They were striving for a purity of thought, even though it was never framed as such. They limited purity to terms of chastity, but the truth is purity is much more than an attitude towards sex. Our purity is also our morality. Purity asks us, are we living a pure life of kindness and compassion? Being pure is being humble and having integrity. Being pure is characterized in our relationships. Are we free from selfishness and greed? Are we living in a state of goodness and wholeness with others? And to use a good Wesleyan term, purity is also holiness and how we treat and love other people, and how we relate to God. Striving for purity in our lives is a good thing. But I'll be honest. When I think of purity these days, I think of another facet yet. Purity in the natural world. When Deb and I were coming back to the UP, we both drove separate cars north. And as I was crossing the Mackinac Bridge, I rolled my windows down, which, by the way, of a certain age, this symbol is no longer going to work. <laughs> I rolled the windows down. But I rolled them down so I could breathe the pure UP air. There was something healing about the air above the bridge. And it wasn't until later that I learned that Deb did the exact same thing. She, too, rolled her windows down so she could breathe the fresh UP Deb's mother, Sandy, was living in Flint during the water crisis. Do you remember the water crisis there? That time not too long ago where many people in Flint were afraid to drink their water because the water was contaminated. It wasn't pure. And a couple weeks ago, after our big snowstorm, the world was covered in snow, and our backyard looked pure and unspoiled 
and its blanket of white. Purity is a measure of cleanliness and pristineness of our natural world, too. So could then, as we strive to keep ourselves pure, are we also being asked to keep the natural world around us pure, too? Could then, in our quest for personal purity, could we also be asked to keep the world pure as an outpouring of love for the natural world, a thing that God loves, too? Could we love nature? Maybe I'm biased, but I do think we live in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Spring is here. And have you ever visited Taquanamon in the spring when the snow is melted and it's filling the rivers and, raider, and the rivers and the waters race to Superior? It's beautiful, isn't it? The sheer power of the water and the air filled with the crashing sounds over the rocks and the water. It's breathtaking. I had some friends who posted a couple of videos of Rainbow Falls this weekend over in Ironwood. And I told Deb immediately, we got to go to these falls while they're still at their peak. Waterfall videos were gorgeous. My daughter Victoria in Chassel has spring flowers blooming around her house already. Hyacinths and violets and daffodils in colors of pink, yellow, and purple. And Teal Lake has opened up. That cover of ice has been mostly replaced. There might be a little ice left, but mostly replaced by a deep azure blue that sparkles in the sun. And soon we'll have spotted fawns learning to walk and run. We can love things as well as people. And I love the UP. I love her people, I love her communities, and I especially love her wilderness, her natural world. We are literally surrounded on all sides by a gift from God. A gift that I, too, believe with my whole heart that God loves as well. So I claim my love for the UP as a spiritual love. But to honor that gift, to keep the natural world pure, takes intentional action. Just like keeping our bodies pure, or our relationships pure, or our moral or compass pointed towards holiness and purity, we need to be thoughtful, intentional, and disciplined in caring for the space around us. Surrounded by so much richness of mineral and lumber, of fauna and flora, we have an abundance of beauty in our midst. We have a fragile gift from God. So whether it's because it's my first spring back in the UP in a long time, or because Earth Day is in a couple days, I don't know. But I'm viewing our surroundings with a new eye and a new appreciation. I'm placing a call to my community to keep the world we love pure, holy, sacred. So in the bulletins this morning, there's some specific ideas on how to keep our world pure. They were collected and put together by the United Methodist Church. And I hope they will inspire you and encourage you to think about acts that you can do to keep our country pure. I pray that not only you think about how to pursue your personal purity, you think about your attitudes not only towards sex and morality, but also protecting nature. And I hope you fall in love again with the outdoors this year. A deep spiritual love. Because, my friends, God made creation. have the opportunity to come together collectively and offer our prayers of concern as well as our thankfulness for our joys to our Father in Heaven. Please follow along on the screen with the appropriate response as I read each one. First one is a concern from Jennifer Riala for Jill. Prayers for healing and strength during cancer treatments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Another concern from Nicole Still for Brad's dad, Gary. Prayers as he begins radiation treatment for prostate cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Another concern from Rebecca Dales for Tammy Hebert, who is battling cancer again. Prayers for successful surgery on Wednesday at Mayo Clinic. Lord, in your mercy, and a concern from Doug and Sue Pearson 
for Sue Holmgren, continued prayers for healing and strength. Lord, in your mercy, and a concern from Dorothy Kuhn for her daughter, Chris Culleton, who needs continued healing from her brain tumor surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a concern from Dorothy for Anne Marie, Brian, Jason, Bruce, and Tracy, who all need healing from ongoing health problems. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a concern from Shirley Hicks for Jill and Cookie facing health concerns. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a concern from Janice and Michael Moore for their grandson, Francisco, and family. Prayers for peace and safety as he has deployed to the Red Sea. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a concern from Dr. Palamaki for Vance, Stacy, Lindy, and Susie as they face their ongoing health concerns. Lord, in your mercy. And a concern from Dick Derby for John for encouraging test results for health concerns. Lord, in your mercy. Heal our prayer. And um, this one is from Cookie. It is a joy, if some of you have not heard yet this morning. Verna Holmgren went home last night to be with Jesus. So we pray for comfort and strength for all of them. But if you knew Verna, you were blessed. That, that, that's all I can say. She was the most wonderful woman I, I've ever met. So we, um, it's a joy, but we, we feel for those that are missing her because she would have been 103 next month and that, that's a lot of years to, um, to miss somebody so and God is good changing and altering. And in all of those, Lord, we stand in awe. We stand in awe that you are a God who is present and patient and who listens and knows each of these things that are on our hearts. From the moments of celebration to the moments of fear and everything in between, Lord, we are grateful that you are a God who is present who listens and who understands what it's like to walk on this earth. So give courage to those that feel afraid. Give strength to those that feel weak. Give hope to those that feel despair. Give love to all of your children. And help us, Lord, have the courage to do the same. Help us, Lord, to have the courage to be your hands and feet each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for your son. We thank you for his presence and his example we thank you for the prayer that he taught us saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy worship come on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of Christ. Amen. So my friends, it's time of uh, offerings, and um, this is another way to worship and serve God, so thank you in advance for your offerings.
surprise us, amaze us, and bless us. And so we're asking that these gifts we bring to your altar, to your table, they can be used to surprise, amaze, love, and bless others as well. In his name we pray.
gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and every day.